In this chapter, we're going to discuss the microbial metabolism. This is looking at various reactions that are occurring within the cells. We're going to look at different reactions that uh, certain standard ones that occur in all microbial cells. So when we talk about metabolism, we're not talking about just one reaction. We're talking about the um, the combination of all of the reactions. That's what's helping the organism to survive. There are different principles that the metabolic processes uh, usually are following certain uh, standard principles such as every cell requires nutrients for survival. Metabolism requires energy. It has to get that energy from some place, either from light or from the breakdown of nutrients. Energy is going to be stored in the form of ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. Um, and cells are going to break down nutrients, not just to one compound, but you have various stages of <clears throat> intermediates or precursors. Um, it's going to use <coughs> those precursors that uses energy from ATP um, to help with run anabolic reactions. Catabolic and anabolic reactions are going to be tied together. Enzymes are going to be necessary for these reactions to occur. And then the cells, <coughs> excuse me, they're going to reproduce. First, they're going to, brand new cells are going to grow in size, and then after that, it's going to reproduce in numbers. The two major categories of reactions are catabolic versus anabolic. Catabolic pathways, in this case, you are taking larger molecules and you're going to break them into smaller compounds. This is going to release energy, so it's called an exergonic reaction. Anabolic reactions is the reverse. It's where you're taking the smaller uh, molecules and connecting them together, forming bonds to make larger molecules. That requires, anytime you're forming bonds, that requires energy. And so that is known as an endergonic reaction. And like I say, they're going to be tied together so that the energy that's necessary to build up larger molecules is going to be, when you break upon, then it's released. So energy uh, that's required is coming from the catabolic reactions. And think of it kind of as a cycle. Uh, certain things are building up, other things are building down. So energy is being released that then needs to be used. And it goes around in this cycle. Now some energy is going to be lost as heat. That's just the way it is. No reaction is going to be 100% efficient in terms of transfer of that um, energy. There are what we call oxidation reduction reactions. Basically what you're doing is you're moving or transferring electrons from one uh, compound to another. So we talk about taking the electrons away from an electron donor and you're giving them to an electron acceptor. Uh, these two types of reactions, oxidation and reduction, must also be connected together because if somebody's receiving electrons, somebody else has to uh, give them up. There are going to be other uh, chemicals, other compounds that act as electron carriers. So they're, they're going to be the ones that are going to be picking up the electrons, moving or shuffling them over to something else. Three important electron carriers that we do see are uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, which is NADP, and flavin adenine dinucleotide, which is FAD. Now you know why I'm like, well, we like to abbreviate things. This is just showing a standard oxidation uh, reduction reaction, which we actually abbreviate as a redox reaction, where you can see the orange circle is giving up an electron. The blue oval is going to be receiving that electron. So because the orange one gave up, uh, lost that electron, you would say it was oxidized. Because the blue one received the electron, you would say that it was reduced. One way that I learned, there's multiple ways, but this is the way that I learned in keeping straight what 
which one's losing, which one is uh, receiving the electron is oil rig. And what that stands for is oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, and you're talking about the electrons. So if it helps you, that's good. Uh, one of the things when we're talking about all these different reactions, if you're thinking, well, why is the cell doing this? It's for ATP production. Whenever you see ATP, you think energy. And so organisms are, are having reactions occurring. Yes, some of them require energy, but a lot of them are releasing energy. Anytime you break a bond, that's releasing energy. So nutrients that it takes in it, as it breaks those nutrients like glucose down, that's releasing energy that then the cell can use. The term phosphorylation just refers to you're adding a phosphate to a substrate. You're sticking a phosphate somewhere on. Um, there's different ways that uh, cells can add phosphate to ADP to form ATP. It can be substrate level phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation, or photophosphorylation. Now in all the uh, various metabolic processes, you're going to see enzymes. Enzymes are uh, a specific type of protein, and what they are, they are a catalyst. That means they're going to reduce the amount of energy that is required for a reaction to take place. And therefore, that reaction is going to essentially occur faster. All enzymes can be classified as one of six different types. And they are classified according to their mode of action. And you're also going to use this as a means of naming enzymes. Uh, trust me, I know this from personal experience. For part of my master's work, I did... Um, discover a new enzyme and you don't get to name it after yourself. You use this guide as to what is the mode of action to classify it, but then also to help name that enzyme. This is showing a table with the six different classifications, what type of reaction the enzyme is involved in, and an example. So, as I said, enzymes are a type of protein. Um, sometimes the enzyme, that protein by itself, it is a complete effective functional enzyme. But sometimes they need to have cofactors to assist them to make it functional. And this is just showing an example of what we would call an apoenzyme is just a protein portion that may not be functional and you may have to add a cofactor or a coenzyme in order for it to be effective and now that whole complex is referred to as a holoenzyme. Uh, cofactors and coenzymes uh, simply are like assistants. They're going to help that enzyme. The difference between them is that a coenzyme is organic in nature. It, it's often a vit what we would classify as a vitamin, and a cofactor is inorganic. It's often things like zinc, iron, that will assist. And once again, here's uh, another table just showing a list of various um, cofactors, coenzymes that do assist um, with the overall functional units of various enzymes. So how does the enzyme work? How does it speed up the reaction? If you look at this table, you can see that there's a certain amount of energy that you must put into any reaction in order for that reaction to occur. Without an enzyme present, you would follow that dotted line. The amount of energy that you must put into a reaction for it to occur is known as the activation energy. And so that dotted line is showing you the amount of energy you've got to put in for that, that reaction to occur. But notice the solid red line is showing that without the, or with, with the enzyme now, it lowers that activation energy. So much less energy is required for the reaction to occur. So therefore the reaction is going to have a higher chance higher probability of occurring, it's going to go faster then.
Now enzymes are going to bind to a substrate. The substrate is going to fit uh, or connect, bind to the enzyme in a very particular fashion. On the enzyme is an area that is known as the active site. That is the spot that the substrate is going to bind to. It is often described as like a lock and a key, that the substrate is the key and the enzyme is a keyhole. So that active site is the keyhole. Only one key can fit in there. It's by shape or by morphology. So when the substrate comes in and it binds to a particular uh, enzyme, it can fit into that active site, then it will bind to it. And whenever you have binding, you're always going to have some type of a shape change that occurs. If it's not the correct enzyme, or if you're studying the enzyme, you say it's not the correct substrate, it's not going to fit into that site, and nothing's going to happen. But if it does fit into that keyhole, if you will, then you're going to have binding and the reaction is able to occur. Is the enzyme altered? Is it used up in the reaction? No, it is not. That's one of the properties of a catalyst. The substrate is going to come in, as you can see in this diagram, and number one, it would come in, it would bind to that active site. When it binds, as I said, there's always going to be a shape change. It may be a very small, subtle change, but there will be a shape change. The reaction occurs. In this case, you're going to break this larger compound down into two smaller products. The products are released whenever you break bonds. There's also going to be a shape change. So now the enzyme, as the product is released, the enzyme goes back to its original shape and can be reused over and over and over. There are a lot of different things that can influence the uh, rate of the reaction. When you're talking about enzymes, they are, as I said, proteins, so there are environmental factors that can affect them. Things such as temperature, pH. The concentration of both the enzyme and the substrate will help to determine the rate of that reaction. Are there inhibitors present that can also alter the rate of the action? So things like temperature and pH will show kind of a classic bell-shaped curve. There will be a range at which um, the enzyme would be active. You go outside that range and it's not going to be functional. Within that range, there's going to be a peak or an optimum point. So in this diagram, it's showing the effect of temperature. And you can see the level of activity starts to increase between, say, 10 and 15 degrees C. It's not at its highest, but it is active. So the range would roughly be from 15 to 45 degrees Celsius would, Celsius would be that range. But look at where the peak is. It looks to be about 37 degrees Celsius. <coughs> that would be its optimum temperature. And you can measure this also to determine what pH is the optimum and also look at the substrate concentrations. Now, your functional protein structure determines function. So the overall 3D shape of that protein is what determines whether it's functional or not. You destroy or disrupt that 3D shape, it's no longer going to be functional. And that's what we call a denatured protein. There are different things that can affect uh, the functionality of the protein. And a lot of it has to do with these environmental conditions such as temperature or pH. In this example, um, figure B with pH, for a particular enzyme that they're looking at, it would be active in a range roughly from 5 to about 10. The optimum seems to be about 7. Now, why is it not active, say, at a lower pH of 2? You don't have enzyme activity measurable at that point. Why not? Well, at that lower pH, it probably denatured the protein 
it disrupted that three-dimensional shape so that it is no longer functional. In figure C, it's showing the effects of substrate concentration. If you only have, um, let's say, 50 enzyme units, and each one, each enzyme unit can bind one substrate. In this graph, you would be looking at, as you add maybe five units of substrate, you get increased activity. Ten units is going to go up even more. Twenty-five will be even higher. But once you reach uh, what we call saturation point, you could add additional substrate that's shown the substrate uh, concentration increasing, but you're not getting any additional enzyme activity. Why? Because all of those active sites are filled. If there's only 50 sites, you can add 100 units of substrate, but there's still only 50 enzyme units. It can only go to its capacity. That's it. So how do you control enzyme activity? Well, sometimes some enzymes are going to be active all the time. They would be present all the time. But most of them are not. Most of them can be turned on and off. So it's a way a cell has of regulating and not wasting energy. Why turn on an enzyme if there's no substrate there? That's a waste of energy, a waste of time. And so you have different ways of controlling the activity. Activators. Some enzymes will become activated when the cofactor binds to that enzyme at some place. The allosteric site is uh, usually a site other than the active site. So when that coenzyme binds to it, and now, as you can see, anytime you have binding, you have a shape change. That now puts the active site in the proper shape so that now it's functional, the substrate can bind, the reaction can occur. Now, sometimes you may want to be able to turn off enzyme activity, and some of this is done genetically, uh, but sometimes there are also things such as inhibitors. There's both competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, and usually inhibition is going to be controlled by what we call feedback inhibition. So, in this diagram, up on the top, we are seeing where you have your enzyme, Notice the active site there. You have a substrate, which normally would bind to that active site, and your reaction would proceed. A competitive inhibitor is one that competes directly with the substrate for that active site. It is shaped such that it can also fit in the same active site that the substrate would fit in. And it basically becomes who gets there first. If the substrate gets there first, the reaction occurs. If the inhibitor gets there first, it blocks the substrate from getting in. As you can see, once the competitive inhibitor binds, there's no way the substrate can bind in there. The spot's already taken. Think of it as competing for a parking spot. You know, if there's only one spot left, whoever gets there first gets it. That's it. So a competitive inhibitor binds to the active site is competing directly with the substrate. Now, uh, sometimes <coughs> what can happen with a competitive inhibitor, uh, you can't really override it, but often these reactions are reversible. So if it binds, it will unbind. And if you have a lot of substrate there, then you increase the probability that the substrate's going to bind instead. Now, a non-competitive inhibitor, what happens here is it's going to compete with the substrate indirectly. The non-competitive inhibitor is going to bind at some other site on the enzyme, not in the active site, someplace else. And we call that an allosteric site. When it binds, what have I been saying? When two things bind together, you're always going to have a shape change. Well, in this case, the non-competitive inhibitor binds, and that binding causes a shape change, and it alters the shape of the active site, making it now impossible for the, the substrate to bind. It won't fit in there. 
It's like when we talk about an enzyme substrate being a lock and key, the lock just changed its shape. The key no longer is going to fit. Feedback inhibition is very commonly used to help regulate this. And what that just means is that as the reaction is occurring, <coughs> in a lot of our metabolic reactions, there's certainly not a one-step process. It's a multi-steps. And what happens is your product, your final end product, part of that will go around and bind Usually in the first step would be most efficient. It might be the second, but usually it's going to be in the first step. And it actually, you're getting your product, but it can also act as an inhibitor to the enzyme that's necessary at that first step. Because enzymes are so specific for the substrates, usually each step has its own particular specific enzyme. So you start making all this product, and some of the product turns around and acts as an inhibitor to turn off the pathway. Kind of makes sense. Okay, we're getting enough product now. Turn it off. We're good for now. A lot of organisms are going to use carbohydrates as their primary source for energy. And within carbohydrates, glucose is going to be the most common one to be used. Now you can break down glucose as you break it down, you're, you're forming ATP. There's two processes, main processes that are used in the breakdown of glucose. One is cellular respiration and the other one is fermentation. In this summer sheet, it's comparing the two and we're going to look at each of these in detail. You have respiration and you have fermentation. Both of them are going to start with glucose. In a series of steps called glycolysis, you will take glucose and you will break it down. Now glucose is a six carbon sugar. You break it down in glycolysis and you end up with two pyruvic acids. Pyruvic acid is a three carbon compound. You must account for all of the, the um, atoms, so all the carbon atoms, all the oxygen atoms, all the hydrogen atoms, they can't just magically appear and disappear. We have to account for all of them. And so because we started with six carbons and pyruvic acid is three carbons, that means you're going to have two molecules of those. In the process of glycolysis, you will produce some ATP. Not a whole lot, but you produce a little bit. Depending on environmental conditions and depending on the cells, not all cells can carry out fermentation. Those that can have a bit of an advantage. So what determines whether a cell goes through fermentation or respiration? It's going to be whether oxygen is present or not. If oxygen is not present, then a cell, if it's capable, will carry out fermentation. It's going to take that pyruvic acid and it will break it down. Uh, and there's a couple of different pathways that it can go through. Uh, acid versus alcohol fermentation and produce specific end products. If oxygen is present, then the cell is going to uh, take that pyruvic acid and continue down through the cellular respiration. When we talk about cell cellular respiration, we are not talking about breathing. We are talking about the breakdown of glucose ultimately to carbon dioxide and water and producing ATP or energy along that process. And oxygen is required. As you can see in the resp uh, respiration side of this uh, diagram, you're going to take the pyruvic acid, eventually move down to the Krebs cycle, then feed into the electron transport chain. So we're going to discuss that all in detail. So glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm for most cells. As I said, you're going to take that six carbon glucose, break it into two, three carbon compounds. Um, you're going to be transferring some phosphates around. Your net gain and I'm talking about net gain, is going to be two ATP molecules 
to NADH molecules. Remember, that's a type of electron carrier. And you're going to have two pyruvic acids per glucose molecule. Glycolysis is a 10-step process. It's going to start off with actually requiring some energy, and then it's going to break the cell, the compound into the two components, and then uh, producing energy. <coughs> now, you'll notice in this diagram, um, you've got the pathway that it is showing. Um, I'm not as concerned on the left-hand side that you know what is the lysis stage, what is the energy conserving stage. What you do have to know is what's in that diagram. You need to know every uh, component, every intermediate, what's coming in, what's going out of this. So in glycolysis, and as you can see in the upper left, it's showing from that diagram we just looked at previously where glycolysis is located in the entire process. So we're at the very beginning. In this diagram, it is only showing the carbons and the phosphates. It is not showing the hydrogens or the oxygens. So glucose has six carbons. It has 12 hydrogens and six oxygens. Step one, you've got the glucose. First thing that's going to happen is ATP is going to come in. You're going to break off a phosphate group, add it to the end of that glucose. So you took off a phosphate, it, so that ATP came in, chop off a phosphate group, it leaves us ADP. Where does the phosphate go that you took off? You attach it to the end of the glucose. And in chemistry, we name compounds in the, there's a specific numbering system. So what glucose 6-phosphate means is that you have a glucose and on the number 6 carbon, there is a phosphate group. Because there's only 6 carbons, that tells you it's on the end. Now there, uh, this, there's actually a few additional steps in here. It's not showing you everything. But you go um, from glucose 6-phosphate. The step it's leaving out is showing that ATP comes in. Uh, well, first you shift around glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Then another ATP comes in, and it's going to stick a phosphate at the other end. So now you have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now you're going to take this six carbon compound and you're going to break it in two. So you now have two, three carbon compounds. And it can go a couple of different pathways. You have an intermediate of the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And then you will end up typically with the uh, uh, two glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And then what the next step is going to be, here comes NAD, and it's going to remove a pair of electrons, and it leaves us NADH. You now have 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid. Now you're going to have ATP come in, ADP come in. It leaves this ATP. Why? Because you're going to remove a phosphate off the end, and it leaves you with 3-phosphoglycerate uh, or phosphoglyceric acid. You're going to lose a water molecule. You're going to shift that phosphate group around, eventually end up with phosphoenopyruvate. Then you're going to have another set of ADP come in and take that phosphate group off. It loses ATP, and you now finally have pyruvic acid. Uh, one thing I want to say, if you're reading uh, different books, um, when you see different terms like 3-phosphoglyceric acid, that is the same thing as 3-phosphoglyceric phosphoglycerate. If it ends with 8, it's the same thing as the ic acid. Uh, down the very bottom where we have pyruvic acid, pyruvic acid is the same thing as pyruvate. Lactic acid is the same thing as lactate. 
So if I use those terms interchangeably, I, I try not to. Um, I try to use the terms that's used in your textbook. Uh, but I do teach from multiple books, and so sometimes I may switch it up a bit. But just so you know, it is the same. Pyruvic acid is the same thing as pyruvate. So at the end of this, your net gain, as you can see, is 2 ATP um, because you required some energy input at the very beginning. Now, this is showing just an example of uh, phosphorylation, in this case substrate level phosphorylation, is where you're adding a phosphate group on. Now, you have that pyruvic acid. You're not done with cellular respiration. You're done with glycolysis, but you're not done with cellular respiration. Eventually, you're going to feed into the Krebs cycle, but pyruvic acid cannot go directly into the Krebs cycle. There's a, a step that has to occur before that, and that is where it needs to be converted to acetyl-CoA. And so in this step, you can see, and this will occur if we're talking about respiration. This will get into fermentation later. So your pyruvic acid that was generated as a product from glycolysis, the first thing that you're going to do is pyruvic acid is a, a three-carbon compound. You're going to remove one of those carbons as CO2. So one of them gets basically chopped off. And then you have coenzyme A come in and bind. And now here comes NAD. It picks up a pair of electrons, leaves as NADH. And what are you left with? You're left with acetyl-CoA. This is kind of this, uh, it's the formation of the acetyl-CoA. It's, it's a pyruvic modification step, if you will. You have to uh, produce that acetyl-CoA, which now can flow into the Krebs cycle. Pyruvic acid cannot. So now that you have that acetyl-CoA in this process of producing it from pyruvic acid, you did generate, because you had two pyruvic acids, you generate two molecules of acetyl-CoA. You have generated two molecules of CO2, carbon dioxide, and two molecules of NADH. You need to, in your mind, keep track as we go through this entire process. Each step, um, certainly keep track of how many NADHs are being produced, because those are going to come up at the end step. They're going to come back. You're going to see them again. So now that you have the acetyl clay, you can now um, have that flow into the Krebs cycle. And uh, we're going to see some of our coenzymes again. This uh, process of the Krebs cycle in prokaryotic cells occurs in the cytosol. Eukaryotics. The pyruvic acid, once it was generated from glycolysis, the pyruvic acid would have been transported uh, from the cytosol into the mitochondria. And that's where everything else will occur in eukaryotic cells, is inside the inner matrix of the mitochondria. But prokaryotic cells don't have a mitochondria, so everything's going to occur in the, the cytosol, the fluid of the cytoplasm. There are going to be six different types of reactions that occur in the Krebs cycle. We're just going to kind of walk through them. And also, just so you are aware, this is one of the things where I know we annoy you students, and I'm sorry, it, it just it is what it is. Um, basically, part of it is scientists get used to doing their own thing and using their own vocabulary, and they can't agree. The Krebs cycle, that's what we call it in microbiology. In chemistry, it is known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And in general biology, and a lot of you may have learned this in EMP, in biology, they tend to call it the citric acid cycle. But in microbiology, we call it the Krebs cycle. Um, they're all the same thing. So if you're thinking, I've never heard of this, but this sure looks familiar, it might be because you know it by one of the other names. So there's three different names for it. With the Krebs cycle, 
Once again, up in the upper left, you can see from that initial diagram where we're located now. So we've gone through glycolysis. We've made now the acetyl-CoA. And on the very top here, you can see the acetyl-CoA is going to flow in at step number one. You lose the coenzyme A, it's going to come off. It recycles and can be used again because you have a constant supply of uh, pyruvic acid coming in. So that two-carbon compound of acetyl-CoA binds with oxaloacetate or ox oxaloacetic acid, which is four carbons. You add the two carbons from the acetyl-CoA, you now have a six-carbon compound that is citric acid. That's why in biology we call it the citric acid cycle. It's the first product. From there, you're going to have a slight conversion, shifting things around a little bit, and it's isocitric acid. Then here comes NAD, takes off a pair of electrons. It leaves as NADH. You also have CO2. You take off a carbon, and that leaves as CO2. So we are now left with a five-carbon compound, alpha-ketoglutaric acid. Now we have another step where in comes the NAD. It's going to remove another pair of electrons, leaves as NADH. You also are going to not break off, cut off another CO2. So it leaves. So now you're left with a four carbon compound. You also had coenzyme A come in and attach to that four carbon compound, leaving you with succinyl CoA. Step five, now what's going to happen, remove that coenzyme A. As you see, it's going to be reused again. It just cycles around. You have a GDP coming in, taking off phosphate, loses GDTP. It's going to then transfer that phosphate to an ADP, so you're generating ATP. So you have a generation, ultimately, of an ATP molecule here. When you had all these processes of making the ATP, removing coenzyme A. Now you're left with succinic acid, still a four carbon compound. Now comes in another one of our electron carriers, FAD. It removes a pair of electrons, leaves this FADH2, and you're left with fumaric acid, still four carbon compound. Now you have water come in, add that to it, forming malic acid. Now comes in NAD, removes a pair of electrons, leaves as NADH, and you're back to oxaloacetic acid. And the process can continue around again. Once again, keep track of notice. You have on here in this step, for per turn, you have Na, one, two, three NADHs leaving. You have one FADH2. You have one ATP. But you didn't have just one acetyl-CoA. You had two because you had two pyruvic acid. We compare everything on a per-glucose molecule basis. So you have to think this one around twice. So you actually had six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two ATPs being generated from this step, this whole process, as you can see here. And you also generated four molecules of carbon dioxide. That step from pyruvic acid to acetyl-CoA, you generated two molecules of carbon dioxide. There are your six carbons from your original glucose molecule. This is where the CO2 is being produced. The overall reaction of cellular respiration is you start with glucose, plus oxygen, and your products are going to be CO2, water, and ATP. Well, right here now we have accounted for the carbon dioxide. So what happens now? As I said, you have to be keeping track of all of those NADHs and FADH2s because they're all going to now show up again with the electron transport chain. This is where most of the ATP is going to be generated. The electron transport chain is a series of molecules. Those electron carriers are going to drop off the electrons, which then get passed <coughs> from one molecule to another until it gets to the final electron acceptor. Every time it gets passed down the chain, 
electrons are going to be pumping protons from one side of the membrane to the other, and that's producing a proton uh, hydrogen gradient. Now, in eukaryotic cells, this is occurring in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. For prokaryotic cells that do not have a mitochondria, this is occurring on the cytoplasmic membrane. So this is one way of showing the electron transport chain of how you come in at the very beginning with, the, and here comes NADH, it drops off its pair of electrons, it leaves as NAD, it can go back now and pick up another pair of electrons and just keep shuffling back and forth. Uh, I have seen in some drawings years ago uh, in a, a general biology book where the NAD um, and FAD were basically described as like two different uh, companies of taxi cabs. And the electrons were like the passengers. It goes and it picks up two passengers at a time and here it's dropping it off. <coughs> at its, its final destination. Because they're two different taxi cab companies, they cannot drop their passengers off the same spot. They're going to be dropping them off at different locations. And that is, is true when you look at this. So NADH drops off its pair of electrons, and as you can see, it's going to pass it, those electrons from one molecule to a next. Until finally, the final electron acceptor is going to receive that pair of electrons, and then that stops the process. So there's different types of carrier molecules. Some of them are flavor proteins, some of them are cytochromes. With aerobic respiration, oxygen is the final electron acceptor. That is why oxygen is necessary for this process to occur. If it's referred to as anaerobic respiration, that means another molecule other than oxygen will be the final electron acceptor. So in this diagram you can see it's showing the membrane. Now for this would be for a prokaryotic cell, it would be the cytoplasmic membrane where these uh, various uh, components and molecules for the electron transport chain are located. So if we go through here step by step we're going to see that number one, you have your first uh, location of where the NADH arrives, and it's, it's a flavor protein, but just now that it arrives here, it drops off its pair of electrons. Follow the arrows, and it will show you the pathway that the electrons are being passed. Now notice also in step one, you pass that pair of electrons, and notice how it's moving the hydrogen ion from the interior portion of the cell outside. You pass those electrons along to ubiquinone, to cytochrome B, then to cytochrome C, then cytochrome A, cytochrome A3, etc. As you pass it along, you are moving hydrogen ions from the inside of the cell to the outside. So you're making this gradient now where you have more hydrogen ions on the outside of the cell. So greater concentration outside, low concentration inside. Which way now are the hydrogen ions going to want to go? They're going to want to flow back inside because they want to go from high concentration to low concentration. So that's what it's showing there in step two. Notice uh, that the FADH2 drops off its pair of electrons a little bit further downstream, if you will than where NADH is, so they're not going to drop them off at the same point. You have those hydrogen ions being pumped outside, and then at step four, I think it's easier to follow this, step four, guess what happens right here? This is ATP synthase. The hydrogen ions, they want to go from high concentration to low concentration, so this is where they are able to flow across the membrane. Now from the outside, flow back in. They're trying to equalize the concentration. So they're going to flow back in. What they do at that point is they activate the ATP synthase, which down at the bottom you can see is adding a phosphate group to ADP, generating ATP. So that's where the ATP is being generated. That last final step of the ATP synthase is often referred to as chemiosmosis.
the hydrogen ions as they come in, what are they doing? Well, they're binding oftentimes to uh, oxygen and forming water. So this is where the overall reaction of cellular respiration, you started off with the glucose, oxygen is required. Why? Because look right back here, that oxygen is receiving those electrons at that final step. It is the final electron acceptor. And what does it form? Here are our products, water, ATP, and what we already previously accounted for, the carbon dioxide. So as I said, chemiosmosis is that last step where you are generating the ATP. Why? Because the hydrogen ions are flowing through. Um, why are they flowing through? Because the previous step with the electron transport chain is pumping them out of the cell. Basically, they want to flow back in. You produce this gradient. You are going to be producing the majority of your ATP molecules from the electron transport step. Now, this is a summary sheet showing uh, for one molecule of glucose, this is for prokaryotic cells. It is showing you how many uh, ATPs were produced and how many were used. So in glycolysis, you actually produce four ATPs, but you needed two of them the very first step, so your net gain was two. And that process uh, produced going from pyruvic acid um, to acetyl-CoA and then feeding through the Krebs cycle, through the Krebs cycle, you produce two ATPs. Now, something else you have to keep in mind for the electron transport chain. Uh, you're saying that um, you're producing about 34 ATPs there. How did they get that number? Well, this is where you have to go back and you have to count your NADHs and your FADH2s. NADHs, if you've been keeping count all along the way, you've produced um, roughly 10, a total of 10 by each step. If you look at glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, etc., cetera, um, you have produced a total of 10 NADHs. For every NADH produced, you will generate roughly three ATPs. So that would be 30. FADH2s that were generated in the Krebs cycle, you produce two of those. Because they come in a little bit further downstream than the NADH, you only produce roughly two ATPs per FADH2. So you had uh, four ATPs generated from those. So 4 from the FADH2, 30 from the NADH, and that's where they got the 34 from the electron transport chain. So you add all that up and you can see that you produced 40 ATPs, however you need it, two in the very beginning of glycolysis, so your net total is roughly 38 ATPs. This is in a prokaryotic cell. Now, some of you may be saying, you know, I've studied this before, and I thought the number was about 36. That's for eukaryotic cells. Because eukaryotic cells have to transport that um, pyruvic acid that was generated from glycolysis, they have to move that across inside into the mitochondria. They're moving across that mitochondrial membrane. That roughly is going to cost you two ATPs. So that's why... Uh, the total net uh, production of ATPs for glycolysis for eukaryotic cells is slightly lower. So this is, you know, one of the cases where prokaryotic cells, I guess, could stand up and say, ha, we're smaller, you think we're simpler, well, we're a little bit more efficient here. Pentose phosphate pathway is just an alternative pathway to glycolysis. It's less efficient in terms of generation of ATP, but it can be used to help uh, produce additional compounds that may be necessary, such as nucleotides, steroids, fatty acids.
Now, sometimes if oxygen is not present, a cell may have to switch to fermentation. Um, it's efficient in terms of, here's the advantage of fermentation. You can still produce ATP in the absence of oxygen. So if a cell can carry out fermentation and it can carry out cellular respiration, if oxygen is present, it's going to go with cellular respiration just because it is so much more efficient. But fermentation can be used when oxygen is not present. It's, it's an extra advantage for survival, essentially. Now, we have learned how to regulate fermentation processes to get particular products that we want. What happens in fermentation is you still have glycolysis occurring. And then when you produce that pyruvic acid, it's like it's a fork in the road. Ooh, if oxygen is present, I'm going down the cellular respiration pathway. If oxygen is not present, then I'm going fermentation. And in fermentation, what's going to happen, that pyruvic acid goes through one of two broad categories of fermentation. One is acid production, the other is ethanol or alcohol uh, fermentation. It depends on the organism as to which they are capable of doing. Uh, human cells, thankfully, another huge discussion we will not get into, but thankfully our cells do not carry out the alcohol fermentation because that would lead to a whole bunch of problems. We carry out acid fermentation, specifically lactic acid. Microorganisms, it depends on which organism you are talking about as to whether it's going to carry out an acid, possibly lactic acid fermentation or other acids that other species can produce, or whether it's going to carry out the alcohol fermentation. Either way, you will generate some, uh, use some uh, NADH. Like I said, it allows you to keep going producing a little bit of uh, ATP. I mean, a little bit's better than nothing. This is a comparison of aerobic respiration, what we just went through, anaerobic respiration, where oxygen is not going to be that final electron acceptor, and then fermentation. So now in terms of the fermentation processes, you, like I say, glucose, is going to go through that glycolysis producing pyruvic acid and then from there like I said it depends on which organism you are using to uh, determine what type of product you're going to get and we have certainly in the whole field of industrial and food microbiology we have learned how to manipulate various organisms to get the product we want whether it's something like uh, using propionic bacteria to make things like cheeses, whether we get certain uh, acid production to make other cheeses or things like yogurt or soy sauce. We have certainly learned how to manipulate the alcohol production to get to various alcoholic beverages and also uh, it's not just food and drink but also other industrial products such as ac acetone that can be used in the lab or commercially dilute it down as nail polish remover, things like rubbing alcohol. <coughs> so there's many uses um, for the products of fermentation. Now these aren't the only pathways. There are a lot of other catabolic pathways. Lipids and proteins, also any compound contains energy in its bonds. So you can break those bonds you can, uh, to release the energy, you can use lipids and proteins as substrates. We tend to study glycolysis of the Krebs cycle in terms of starting with glucose. Remember glycolysis is a 10-step process, and so you don't have to always start at step one. You can move in at any point along the process. So in terms of producing things like uh, lipids, um, here you've got uh, fat compound, fatty acid, you've got the glycerol with the fatty acid chains, 
<coughs> you can start to break things down into smaller components, and then those can feed in anywhere along the way. Same thing with um, proteins, you can break them down. Just know you can feed in at any point along the process. Photosynthesis is a process of where organisms, uh, not all organisms, but some of them, are able to absorb solar energy, light energy, and they are able to use that through a series of reactions and produce um, ATP. Essentially, photosynthesis is the reverse of cellular respiration because it is taking carbon dioxide and water, and with this energy, it is producing carbohydrates, usually uh, glucose, and one of the byproducts is going to be oxygen. So you can kind of, if you draw that, you can kind of think of photosynthesis and cellular respiration as feeding each other. They cycle back and forth. The products of one become the substrates for the other. They are dependent upon each other. Chlorophyll is... Um, what gives like plants that green pigmentation in their leaves and some bacteria certainly algae also have chlorophyll so it's not just plants uh, that have that chlorophyll it, it it enables them to capture that light energy that solar energy in those pigments and then start the process <coughs> of photosynthesis in prokaryotes the various molecules that are necessary that are containing the chlorophyll and are able to absorb that solar energy is going to be located in the, the cytoplasmic membrane. In eukaryotes, these uh, pigmentations, chlorophyll will be embedded within the chloroplast. And this just shows a diagram of in a the chlorophyll embedded in the membrane of a prokaryotic cell, and then the thylakoid where it's embedded in the chloroplast of a eukaryotic cell. There's two, within photosynthesis, it's broken down into two photosystems, photosystem one, photosystem two. Uh, it's going to absorb the solar energy and then go through a series of reactions and then store it as ATP. Uh, one of these reactions is light dependent, obviously, to absorb that solar energy. And then the second part of it is light independent, meaning that it's going to go through the process of making or synthesizing the glucose from that carbon dioxide and water. I'm not going to require that you know photosynthesis in great detail, just know that light dependent reactions, you're going to be moving now electrons down a chain, electron transport chain as well. Uh, and photophosphorylation is adding that phosphate group, forming the ATP, and it can be either cyclic or non cyclic. So the light comes in, it hits that pigmentation of the, the chlorophyll, and it's going to be transferring uh, those electrons around until it reaches the electron acceptor. That would be in photosystem one. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see, there are similarities between uh, cellular respiration and photosynthesis in terms of, yes, you're using these electron transport chains, moving the uh, electrons along. And this is a comparison of different types of phosphorylation. The light independent reaction, as it says, does not require that light directly. It's dependent on the previous step, which did. Um, and now what you're going to do is fix that, what we call fi carbon fixation. There's three different steps. The fixation of CO2 reduction and then regeneration. It uses the Calvin-Benson cycle. Now, Notice some of the names of these compounds as you have the carbon benzene cycles cycling around. Ultimately, as you go through, you are forming the um, G3P down to glucose 6-phosphate and then glucose. Kind of looks like the reverse of glycolysis, doesn't it? 
There are several different uh, pathways that are used to synthesize different uh, compounds that are required in the cell. And these are often changing depending on what's occurring right now. What are the needs of the cell right now? That is what is going to determine. Do you need to be building up more compounds? Do you need to be breaking down compounds? What are the energy needs, etc. So a lot of the reactions can go either way. It can either build up or break down compounds. These, uh, this table is showing precursors, uh, various intermediates, if you will, for a lot of different uh, reactions that can occur within the cell that are needed. They can be used in multiple ways. Uh, we used to have a saying in a microbial physiology course of, all pathways lead to pyruvic acid. You're going to find that pyruvic acid is certainly a huge player involved with so many different reactions that, say, glycolysis, um, as is shown here, now it's showing forming the glucose. If you need to store larger compounds, you need to make peptidoglycan for the bacterial cell wall. So how it goes through and uses a lot of these um, intermediates. Glycolysis is the breakdown of glucose. Gluconeogenesis is the formation of glucose. It's going in the reverse order. But a lot of things will all start with that pyruvic acid and break off from there. So as I just said, a lot of these reactions are uh, reversible. They can go in either direction depending on what the needs are. If you need to make uh, lipids, fats, you can take that glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, the G3P, uh, and go through and make glycerol from that. From glycolysis, you can make the acetyl-CoA instead of having acetyl-CoA feed into the uh, Krebs cycle. It can be used for making fatty acids. So it just depends on, you know, supply and demand. What is needed right now? Which pathway am I going to go through? This is just showing production of uh, making amino acids, nucleotides, So cells are going to, like say, uh, they're going to break, the cells are great at recycling. So what they don't need, if they break it down, they can use those components then for making the compounds they do need right now. Some things for very common reactions like glycolysis, those enzymes are going to be made all the time because you're always going to, in some fashion, be using glycolysis. Other enzymes, though, may only be made when it's necessary, when it's needed at that time. They don't need it, they stop. Uh, there's a fine line between efficiency and laziness. So I always say that, you know, microorganisms, uh, I've spent a lot of time studying both fungi and bacteria, and you could argue, is it being lazy? But not doing stuff, or is it just being efficient? Don't make what you don't need. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your energy. Don't waste waste your your nutrients, your supplies to make something that you don't need. Uh, eukaryotic cells, um, they can often kind of isolate enzymes into different membrane-bound organelles, which are carrying out very specific functions they can kind of isolate them to certain areas. Now usually, as I mentioned earlier, once feedback inhibition is a very effective way of regulating and controlling um, enzymes from the standpoint it's or the production of enzymes, production of your products. When the product level concentration gets too high, shut it down. You don't need any more. Now, there's different ways of controlling uh, and regulating mechanisms. One is with gene expression. Uh, you're controlling the amount of protein production, the amount of enzyme production. Like I say, don't even make the enzyme if you don't need it. And the other way of controlling is by metabolic expression. Um, and that's where you're still making the enzyme but this is, would be an example of where once you've produced enough product, shut it, shut it down, that inhibition. And this is just showing, I know it looks rather confusing, 
but it's showing the pathways used for uh, polymerization or making of your macromolecules, your proteins, your nucleic acids, your polysaccharides, carbohydrates, and your uh, lipids. <coughs> and you can see how there is, whether it's a catabolic or anabolic reaction, so they go hand in hand depending on what the needs are. You can build up or you can break down.